House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back to the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren. My co-host today is Mr. Michael Butterfield. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing well. How are you, Al? I'm always good. Even when I'm bad, I'm good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So you're do- driving around San Francisco making a show. Yes. I'm not allowed to talk about a lot of the details yet, but yes, I was working on a Zodiac show in San Francisco in uh, December. That's pretty amazing that that uh, there's still a lot of uh, talk about Zodiac. There's still a lot of shows being made. You know? Oh, yeah. It just yeah. gets more and more popular as the years go by. It's a... Uh, uh, relentless true crime story and it doesn't help that it's an unsolved case too so that just keeps people going well yeah you know that it's kind of one of those things that probably won't get solved you know yeah unfortunately likely. it looks that way sometimes yeah 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 it's going to be a, a shot in the dark to get that one hmm. um now now speaking of old cases now we've got um a great guest returning guest he's a friend of the shows here and um he's got a new book out and uh, it's definitely worth picking up, and uh, oh, yeah. we're, we're excited to talk about it. And you know a lot about the uh, person in the case, we'll say. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so now the book's called Shadow Man, and our guest is the author, and it's uh, Ron Francel. Thank you for being here, Ron. Hey, I wouldn't be anywhere else. Thank you for having me, you guys. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, mm-hmm. It's good to get uh, good writers and people that, you know, that really uh, do research and get involved in, in a case. And y- you learn so much, you know. And then you call me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and you can't get a hold of those guys, you call me. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, you know. All uh, right. When in doubt. Um, <laughs> well, it, but that, that brings me to this. Like you, because I know writing myself, um, you have to really get into the case, so so to speak, and you do a lot of research. You meet a lot of people. You kind of get involved, and and you go all around and stuff. When you finish a book like this, this is a, a you know grisly case, and it's uh, pretty you know harrowing, I guess you'd say. So, but when you finish this and it, you get it to the publisher and you're done, do you find that that process has changed you each time you do a book like this? You know, that's a good question that I get a lot, and it's it's kind of interesting. Uh, for me, uh, I you know, I spent 30 years as a, a journalist, um, much of that at the Denver Post, and some piece of that covering the war on terror from the Middle East. So uh, in that time, I've just learned pretty well to compartmentalize all my emotions, all these things that you feel and you see, because that's what you need to do to tell these kinds of stories, whether it's in newspapers or in books. And of course, now I'm into the books. I've got to tell you, the sight of a dead child touches a, a deep down part of me. But the best thing I can do is to tell her story, not stand there crying. Um, you know, a whole family killed by a drunk driver, their bodies are still in the wreckage that tightens my jaw in a way that you, my teeth might break, but it, it, you know, weeping about it just makes me look away. And I, I can't look away because I have a job to do. Um, I'm, I'm old now and I, I write books about ordinary people who shouldn't have died but sometimes they died in spectacularly grisly ways sometimes i want to cry but i can't without losing some of that spark that i need to put in to their words not weeping so i keep telling myself i'll cry later but never uh, never seems to come you know later never seems to come Right, right. Well, there's um, always another story, right? Yeah. There's always one right behind it. Doesn't matter. Um, and when you talk about, well, you finish a book, uh, you kind of never finish it. I mean, you might put you know, the end on your manuscript. 
script, but then you send it to an editor who has comments and proofreaders who have comments and then ultimately reviewers and interviewers and uh, it, then it comes out and you're you're dealing with that. By that time, you're really into another one. So uh, it's uh, there. There is no later on these things. And I, as I look back on my career uh, of writing about uh, difficult stories like that, uh, consequential stories uh, about life and death, uh, I can't recall but one time that I was moved to tears. Um, and I think that's just an effect of that compartmentalization. It happens to journalists as much as it happens to uh, cops, to medical examiners, to those people who are on the front line of that, that awfulness. You know, um, we, we interview a lot of fiction writers on the show as well, and uh, they write stories similar to this, but in a fictional setting. So it's all created. Yeah. And quite often I always ask them how they create that character and how they develop them and begin get a relationship like what is it and they they describe it a lot of times as either seeing or hearing the characters and they talk to them and they create this story now it's not that way for nonfiction. it's not that way for true crime but how do you hear um the people in your story how does it how does that work for you um well first of all if any writer starts hearing those voices, that's, <laughs> that's called schizophrenia. I, <laughs> I don't buy the conversations with fictional people. I know what they're saying though, is that they're thinking in the stead of, of somebody that they've created. Um, in my case, I talk to as many of these people as I can. Now, obviously, in this particular case, I have a lot of people who were um, victims who are gone. I have uh, players at the time who are now gone. Um, I just try to do uh, as much research as I possibly can. I want to tell a compelling story. Uh, I don't want to follow that formula. I, and, you know, that's been at my, <laughs> to my peril, I think. Uh, but that's what I want to do. I'm spending two to three years with a story. It better be one that uh, I, I like. It's like a roommate. It, it moves into yeah. your house and you want, you want not to have a terrible relationship with the story. So um, I, I'm looking for characters, the ones that are still here. I'm trying to talk to them and capture that voice. I've said that um, in, in this case, that I, um, it all boiled down, even throughout that research, that, that I knew I'd be ready to write this book, Shadow Man, uh, when I could hear Susie Yeager's voice in the dark, and I don't mean her speaking to me, it's just right, the tone of it and the, and the, the, the tenor of it. And then I knew I knew her. Hmm. And I, you know, and again, I'm getting, I joked about the schizophrenia. Um, <laughs> I Which I should. And, I and say we'll it all get the time. Tagged, we'll get tagged by the woke <laughs> for that. Um, but I, I, and I don't mean a conversation with her. I just mean it, just the sound uh, that anybody could have heard back then. This is quite an um, an older case, and and one thing I know we talked about before being on air. Um, this is something that really hasn't hit. Um, mainstream it's not like there's not like a lot of shows and and books and it's not all over the place so this is a fairly um, unknown case in the general population which which leads me to kind of go two ways with that one is of course um, what brought you to that um, kind of a case how did you find it and stumble across it and 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 the second part of that of course would be 
why are cer certain cases like the Zodiac something that's endless, while others like this uh, you never hear about? Um, you're right. It hasn't, it hasn't, um, of course, sort of seeped into the public consciousness the way a lot of stories have. Um, uh, part of that is that it, it happened nearly 50 years ago, but that's not that long when you consider that, um, you know, there's hardly a primetime TV drama or a movie mystery or a crime book that doesn't feature profiling in some form. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to think that cops have always been intuitive about the, the bad guys that they're chasing. In fact, it, it's less than 50 years ago that two FBI agents uh, formulated this idea that you could look at crime scene evidence and do certain certain things about the behavior and the psychology of the perpetrator. So uh, shadow man's about these two pro these pioneering pro uh, profilers, these FBI agents, how they conceived the first ever criminal profile in the early 1970s and how that helped a, a frustrated agent back in Montana who had no leads, no witnesses, no suspects in in a couple of grim Montana murders. And, of course, in, by the end of the story, they all discover that they've been unwittingly dealing with something that was far bigger and far darker than they ever imagined. I heard about it while I was reporting for the Denver Post. I was a senior writer in charge of writing about the evolution of the American West. And I came across sort of a two sentence mention of this case basically said it's about a kidnapping that resulted in the first profile. And, and I thought, Oh, well, that sounds interesting. I'll look into it someday. And I set it aside. It was, I don't know, maybe a decade or more later that I came back to it. And, and by that time, well, at that time, I sort of discovered it was, it was more than a kidnapping. It was much more. It was, it was this grotesque series of crimes in a part of the country where I grew up. I'm a Wyoming kid. This was in Montana. They're, they're uh, sort of, uh, the same place with a border in between. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, and I saw, uh, not only the historic turning point for forensic history, but nobody had ever told this story. And most people outside of Montana, even a lot of crime buffs had never even heard of it. So why does that happen? Um, I, I think part of it is um, just our media and where we've come. Uh, the, the criminal mind has always fascinated us. Um, when an, uh, a particularly deviant crime happens, uh, our, our rational brain wants to put things in order. It, it, it things have fallen out of order we want to put it back so we want to make sense out of something senseless um we ask why and not coincidentally that's the first question profilers use too but that's not surprising since the beginning of mankind we've wanted to understand uh the threats that are out there to feel safe to avoid unnecessary death. Um, so I, I don't think that ancient fascination has changed. I think our media has changed. Mm -hmm. And consequently, then, there's a long way to coming back to your question. The cases that fascinate um, tend to have, uh, tend to have been picked up by our media. They, they are things like Ted Bundy. I'm telling you, um, 
a friend of mine, Kevin Sullivan, is probably the world's greatest expert on Ted Bundy, but there are 110 more Bundy writers out there and they're churning yeah. stuff out weekly. Yeah. Uh, TV yeah. shows don't give up on him. You know, BTK, John Wayne Gacy, um, Zodiac, Black Dahlia. Um, it, it, so there's, there's this fascination, I think, that's driven a little bit by the media. And then some of these other cases kind of get left behind because they don't have the, uh, they don't have that fascination for the producers. Mm -hmm. um, they don't seem to have that, that, that hook that they're looking for. And that's why they'll do, you know, endless Ted Bundy episodes, but nothing on uh, Shadow Man, the Shadow Man, what I call, I guess, the Shadow Man case. Well, you had talked about how this was a, a stunningly, uh, brutal case with a, several murders involved yeah. but where did this story start you know it seems like the the abduction of this little girl was the starting point for it and they had no idea what it was going to become as they kept investigating so could you touch a little bit on that sure uh, no idea whatsoever it's uh the summer of 1973 and this family from michigan is on this grand western vacation and they're stopping at all the roadside attractions on the way they end up in a campground in rural montana uh they, they have a great time there the whole family it's a mother father grandmother grandfather and five kids this is just idyllic for them uh one the night before they're to leave uh, four of the five kids cram themselves into a tent. They want to sleep outdoors. They snuggle up in their sleeping bags uh, as closely as you can imagine. Uh, and the next morning, one of the kids wakes up and feels a breeze and notices that there's a large hole in the back of the tent and that her seven-year-old sister is gone. Uh, you know, she's confused, you know, how there's a rip in the tent, but uh, she gets up and looks for her little sister, thinking she's gone outside for a walk or to go to the bathroom or something. Uh, but she's not there. And she, the, the, the big sister raises an alarm and the whole family, and, uh, Everybody else in the campground is aroused and everybody's looking for this little girl, but she is not around. So the sheriff is called. Uh, the, the sheriff's deputies get out there. They they have a gut instinct that this isn't a little girl wandering off. Uh, they call the FBI. The FBI has to get involved under federal law by cases like in cases like this um, goes back to the Lindbergh kidnapping. At that point, uh, uh, the largest search, uh, the largest manhunt uh, in Montana history is mounted. A thousand people, uh, mostly volunteers, are out literally beating the bushes looking for this little girl. And they find nothing. So as the week unfolds, as the next month unfolds, and the month after that, and finally months and months, this FBI agent uh, who's leading the, the investigation, a guy named Pete Dunbar, uh, is growing ever more frustrated because he's got nothing. He... he and no good leads. No, as I said, no good leads. No, no witnesses. Certainly no evidence. They, the only evidence they have is that whoever took little Susie Yeager had cut a large hole in the back of the tent, pulled her out of the tent, and then disappeared to a, a parking lot maybe a hundred yards away, and then left. Uh, the they saw a trail, a, a, a sort of 
vague trail of footprints going off through the dew in the grass toward that parking lot. That was their only real clue. Uh, and wasn't so, there a, uh, wasn't, excuse me for interrupting, yeah, wasn't there yeah. a uh, report that they'd seen, someone had seen a truck in that area? I, yeah, there were reports that earlier somebody had seen a truck, but there, there were reports galore. I mean, as the days mm-hmm. went on, they, they were getting hundreds of reports. And part of it is that the little towns nearby, like little towns are known to do, believe that that everybody knows everybody and uh, so if you had a a deviant person like that that everybody would know Uh, so by by extension it must be an outsider yeah Yeah. and the you got to put yourself in the time Uh, the Manson trials have ended you know within the last couple of years before this uh watergate is is going on uh the, the vietnam war has you know has roiled the the culture for for years um the counterculture has has not only you know a peace and love hippies but it has a darker side with the Black Panthers and the weather underground Um, to the rural Montana and probably to rural people throughout the West and many other places, the world seemed to be falling apart and their world seemed the same right there in their little spaces. Uh, But the rest of the world was falling apart. So, So again, that must mean that somebody from that, that world, that, that crumbling world out there must have done this. Um, and so a lot of tips were coming in about Volkswagen buses with long haired kids in them. And maybe mm-hmm. there was a, there was a child in there and, uh, you know, it, it uh, somebody having seen a truck in a rural Montana campground wasn't a particularly, um, uh, notable kind of observation. I mean, it's, you want to say, and what? <laughs> and what's the next thing? But that was it. Somebody had seen a truck. And and to be fair, somebody had also seen a couple of different cars with kids in them and, you know, a Volkswagen bus and all kinds of, they had many reports. So um, there, there, there was nothing. The FBI felt that uh, they wanted to obviously wanted to have more, but they didn't. And uh, that was a frustration for Dunbar, his partner and local law enforcement. Well, and it's it's one of those stories where, you know, you think about what this individual did, cutting a hole in a tent in the middle of the night and just taking a child. It was very brazen behavior. So for these investigators, most of what they had to work on was just behavioral analysis. So you want to talk well, a little bit about how that started? Well, it, it, <laughs> you're right. They had only their gut instincts to go on. Many of them, I I would wager none of them had ever worked a case like this. Um, that, that it's not typical even today. Uh, the, the, there were eight months later, after Susie disappears, a teenage girl in a nearby small town, a 19 year old waitress named Sandra Smolligan goes missing. At that point, nobody's thinking that these two things are related. They're just the disappearances of two different human beings, but they're not even placing them you know, on the same desk there, nobody's thinking that it's just the disappearance of a teenage girl. Uh, But after it, during their searches for her, they find her car hidden in a barn on a very remote abandoned ranch. Uh, As they begin then to search more, In a more precise uh, way, they find uh, 
bones. They can't find shards of bones and, and these bits uh, have been show some charring and they've been scattered all over this ranch as if by the wind. So they collect what they can and they send it off to the Smithsonian, which gets back and, and says, indeed, if these bones belong to a, uh, a young female in the teens or early 20s, um, given the proximity to the car, uh, they believed that they had the remains of Sandra Smulligan. But the Smithsonian also told them that among those shards and pieces of bone are other pieces of bone that belong to a much younger female under 10 years old. Uh, at that moment, they, they put the two together, that, that they probably had the remains of both Sandra Smulligan and Susie Yeager, and they might now be dealing with one killer or one set of killers and not two separate crimes. But that's all they have then, too. They're, they're in no better position other than they've got somebody who took the car, hid it, and then cremated and pulverized the, the remains and scattered them across this ranch. That's all they had. So they're back to square one uh, in February of 1974 and, and, and still as frustrated as ever. The lead, that lead in, it, it, agent who on this case, Pete Dunbar, has to go back to Quantico for some ordinary, you know, regularly scheduled training. And while he's back there, he happens to attend a workshop in Quantico put on by these two uh, fellow agents. One, a guy named Pat Mullaney, was uh, trained in psychology. The other, named Howard Teton, was uh, known as one of the FBI's premier uh, crime scene investigators. And they believed, as I said earlier, that, that um, there was something they could tell about the unknown subject, the unsub, which everybody knows, mm -hmm. uh, because of TV. And it intrigued Dunbar because he didn't have anything else. Uh, he didn't even have much evidence. So he followed these guys after the workshop down to their basement uh, offices and presented his case. Um, ultimately, they decided that maybe this was a, they, they had never put together a profile. It was, a, the whole idea was considered by none other than J. Edgar Hoover himself to be hokum. The pure black magic, and and he didn't like it. Uh, so th these guys uh, they sort of stayed under the radar, talks to, talked amongst themselves. Uh, but then Hoover died, and more progressive leadership came in, and they were given a longer leash, and that's when they started doing these workshops. So when Dunbar comes to them in their basement, um, they think this might be a good case to, to start the, to do their first profile. And it, it, it ultimately happened. But the fact is they thought it was a kind of low risk case, right? They could, it was one where it was a good test. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a mass murder. It wasn't, uh, you know, somebody like Juan Corona or Dean Coral where you have dozens of dead. They just had a couple of uh, presumed murders in rural Montana uh, without a suspect. And so they thought that it was um, an easy beginning or at least a low risk beginning. So uh, there, there, there were things that came out in their profile that were just as you say, and I, I think that uh, they had no roadmap. They had no 
There were no rules. There was no database. They were pretty much um, just using experience and logic. And, and to be fair, a little guesswork. Well, and that brings us to an interesting point to touch on part of what they had thought, which and you talked about this, that they thought that this was what you might call an intimate crime and that therefore this individual might take it on in such a way that it would be something he might want to celebrate on the anniversary of the crime. And how did that lead to the next part of the story? Well, that was, that was one of the elements of their profile that uh, the, the suspect or not the suspect, the perpetrator um, they believed would have internalized this in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And that was based on their beliefs about psychopaths like this. And they were, they were making some assumptions there, but that assumption was in play that they were dealing with a psychopath and they believed that the psychopath would internalize this. He would make it more intimate. It would be part of him. It would almost be part it would almost be part of him like a family. And so you're right. They predicted that uh, he would mark some anniversary the way you and I mark birthdays or wedding anniversaries, that kind of thing. So they, they alerted Dunbar and they alerted his team that this might happen. And indeed, on the one year anniversary of the crime, uh, the phone rings in the the parents in Susie Yeager's parents house in Michigan, and things start to unfold. It it turns out what might have been a hoax um, was dismissed when he was able to identify things that had never been in the media and at least in one case hadn't even been told to the FBI. Mm -hmm. It was like when he said it, the mother uh, admitted to the FBI later she had forgotten about that completely and it's true, but she'd never told them. So they knew they had been talking to the the abductor and the presumed killer of Susie Yeager. And he was very bold in the very beginning when he called and he said, is this Susie's mother? And Marietta Yeager said, yes. And he said, well, I'm the one that took her from, took her from you a year ago to the minute, right? It was Mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Uh, His, his, Cajones in this case are enormous. Uh, the risk that he took uh, were was uh, unbelievable, but it was part of the thrill for him, mm-hmm. and that played a role in the profile as well. But it, imagine what it takes to skulk in the dead of night to a tent cut a half moon shaped hole in it, reach in, drag out a child with three brothers and sisters around her who don't wake up to find your way in the dark through a park full of trees uh, and full of other campers to a vehicle and get away. Think about what it takes to call the family and to Mm -hmm. taunt the mother the way he did uh he was a sadist but he he loved the thrill he he was a moth drawn to the flame and and all of those things played a role ultimately well they played a role in a, a kind of unfolding profile the original one was several points but then they kept adding things as they were learning things. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and that was one of them. And so uh, he was in some ways um, uh, sort of setting his own trap, not knowing that there were people out there doing something called profiling. 
he thought he was just calling and taunting this family uh, and being a sadist in sort of rubbing her face in it. Do you think it was that thrill or about the crime itself that that allowed him to be so brave? Like, to, to, what would make someone like that think they could uh, cut a hole in the tent and steal a kid without anybody else noticing? Like, that in itself, in an idea, if you think about that, sounds crazy. You'd think he would try something a little bit more, less risky, I guess. Yeah, safer. Yeah. Uh, it, that was part of his mentality and, and not, uh, not unusual in some sadists uh, mentality that, that the risk is a thrill. The risk itself is part of the thrill. Forget yeah. the killing or the, the abduction or the, just the risk itself um, and and he certainly exhibited that in in his crime. Later, we see him exhibiting it. You know, it, 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 sort of in retrospect, we see him exhibiting it along the way. Whether it's his contact with officers, his his demeanor when he's talking to um, the family it's it's fascinating to me and uh he's it, it, you know what it's another reason that that it's a little surprising that nobody has has written a book about this before now mm -hmm. or paid much attention to the story despite despite the historical significance of it in forensics uh just the crime itself it kind of uh, befuddles me. And I, I think there are several reasons for that, but uh, it, it, it's, it was attractive to me as I'm reading about this. I, I thought I was fascinated by the story. I was fascinated by the history, but I think what put me over the edge in terms of deciding whether to write a book was realizing nobody ever had. So this was unplowed earth, and that appealed to me. When when you were writing this book and when you're putting it together, did you have some sort of a, an, let's see, an idea of what you wanted people to get out of the book? So when, when one of the readers picks it up and reads and goes through it, at the end of the book, what is it you hope they take away? I probably have said this on Alan's show before that the secret of my success as a writer is that I never pick a story that I can screw up. <laughs> <laughs> and the shadow man struck me as a story like that. You know, it, to me, it's power was in universal stuff like a mother's anguish and the persistence and the doggedness of the, the investigators and our fear of the dark. Uh, it was all of those things. And I wanted to tell a story. I, like I said, I wanted to tell a consequential story I, as I have wanted to do throughout my crime writing career. I, I've, wanted to tell a consequential story. I didn't want to pick up, um, you know, a tabloid and read about a husband who killed his wife and then hid her body in a barrel or something. Yeah. I wanted there to be something more than that. I don't know if there's a message I want people to come away with, but I want them to come away with a, a different view of, of uh, law enforcement and what it does and how it, moves its own sciences forward but i also want them to to read about this particular uh case because i think it's half a bubble different from a lot of cases we see just like we were talking earlier i'm bored with ted bundy and in fact hmm. i'm i'm really not fascinated by serial killers except as the catalysts for bigger human stories and yeah. setting them in motion. 
Um, I'm far more interested in the Marietta Jaegers who, who get splashed by this horror and who have to deal with it. And I think in a, in any of these cases, the greater the evil, then the greater the hero. And those are the stories I want to tell. Uh, if nothing else, people could come away with the idea that they do survive this awfulness and there's something they can do with it. Well, you know, you were talking about the, uh, the, the uh, way that profiling was first developing at this time and how some people viewed it as, you know, voodoo or nonsense. Yeah. And uh, you talked a little bit about how when they first started to apply the profile in this case, and of course, as the case started to grow, there was some resistance and some disagreement about things. Some people thought that this particular individual who had propped up as a suspect might be the guy. Others thought that he wasn't. Um, if I remember correctly, he had taken a lie detector and truth serum and uh, denied any involvement in the crime. And some people seem satisfied by that. Could you talk a little bit about how that battle sort of started and how it went yeah and it was really months uh after the profile before things really started to take shape up to that point um the the main well i say the main suspect they had a lot of people of interest one guy's name kept popping up he was a former Marine, um, well-spoken, uh, or, uh, dressed well, had no, uh, no crime history whatsoever, uh, even wanted to help as much as he could. Now, self-employed as a carpenter uh, and bought houses and renovated them to, he, he rented them out. So he he would pop up on the radar and then almost as quickly pop off the radar. Um, the, the people who interviewed him just didn't see him as the guy while the profilers were saying, you know, maybe this is the guy you want to look at, or they at least came to that eventually. This is probably a guy that you want to look at. And they kept saying, well, no, it's not that guy. Uh, and a lot of this comes from the fact, like you say, uh, that it was profiling was viewed at the time by the boots on the ground cops and deputies, and even FBI agents uh, as as black magic, as voodoo, that that they that the way you solved crimes was talking to people. It was footwork. And, and it was just kind of Sherlockian deduction. And that's how you did it. You used, you depended on your gut. So they, they kind of dismissed this um, as a kind of pop psychology. And of course, in the early seventies, there was a lot of that going around. I, I, so that was one of the conflicts that was going on the lead FBI agent, Pete Dunbar, was actually from this area. Now, he had he had served in the FBI in New York and Washington, D.C. He'd, he'd been around and been on big cases, but he wanted to come back to this part of Montana because his parents still lived there and they were getting older. So he, he was sent back out to western Montana. Uh, he knew these people. He, he had a sense of the people around him and that to him made it, it, it elevated um, his view of how this should go because he knew more. Not, he wasn't an arrogant, that's not what I'm getting at. He, he was a guy who felt like he understood these people and a couple of guys back in Virginia couldn't understand them or they weren't factoring that in. And so there was a lot of conflict uh, between Dunbar and the profilers uh, about things. It wasn't always consequential, but it, it did end up 
with this particular guy who would get on the list and Dunbar would talk to him and say, this couldn't be him. And as you point out, uh, he actually took two lie detector tests and the truth serum test and passed, uh, it's cliche to say with flying colors, he passed in such a way that there was no indication, not even the slightest blip that he was being deceptive. And the, that weighed heavily with Dunbar. He, he felt that couldn't be done. The profilers said, well, yes, it can. He's, if, if you give a, a lie detector test to a psychopath, he is likely to pass because he's wired differently. So his body doesn't react in the ways we expect ordinary people. And it might not react in a way that indicates he's lying. And I know we're getting short on time here, but I wanted to ask you real quick if you could expand a little bit on how their interpretation of his behavior, especially during his phone call with the mother, indicated to them that he had a fear of strong women and how they eventually used the mother against him. Absolutely. Um, you, We talked about it earlier that he, he, early in his call, he was taunting, he was sadistic, he, he, he was, you know, he wanted to hurt her. Mm -hmm. He wanted to scare her. But she stood in there. And that's what makes her the hero of this story, really, mm -hmm. is that she stood in there and she was grieving and, and she was sick at heart and she was afraid. Um. But she stood in there and she kept him on the line. She talked to him. She asked questions. Um, she didn't lose her composure. And she challenged him. She challenged him. And by the time the phone call ends, he's, he's lost some of his composure. He's even sobbing uh, by the time they hang up. And what that tells the profilers is exactly what you said, that here's a guy who is um, has a problem with women. And, and at that time, profile they based a lot in profiling on the belief that uh, psychopaths always had some sexual element, some psychosexual element at play. Uh, so they deduced from that that he had a difficulty with strong women because he probably had uh, an, a, either a completely dominating mother or a, a mother who had been completely dominated, mm -hmm. uh, which there's a little counterintuitive stuff there. But uh, it, it, that became part of their profile, too. Uh, so they're taking things from that. And in a subsequent call, it's the literally the sound of his voice that gets, um, that works against him. So, uh, it, it, and, and then there's even a third phone call that offers some evidence. So he, as I said earlier, he's setting his own trap. Yeah, it was ultimately his undoing. Yeah. It is, it is, it is not the profile that, slaps the cuff on uh, the cuffs on it it only narrows the pool as profiling is intended to do it, it merely narrowed the pool of suspects um, by giving investigators a, a decent idea of who their guy might be um, unlike tv these these guys don't jump on private airplanes and show up at crime scenes mm -hmm. and carry guns and chase suspects and, and arrest them. They don't do that. They help investigators narrow the pool. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I, you sure they don't take those planes, planes, private planes? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder what television show you're referring to. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't. Know. I can tell you that these two guys, uh, Teton and Mulaney, never went to Montana. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, they never went 
uh, in for the rest of their lives went to Montana. So uh, this was this was both art and science at the time. It wasn't because there's a certain amount of flying by the seat of their pants, but a lot of it, most of it, was their experience and their logic. Wow, quite quite a quite a story, and uh, of course, um, great writer who did it. So oh, that's fantastic. Good combination. Um, so, how are you doing on social media? Are you getting into social media? Do you like people to interact with you on on different social media platforms? Absolutely. I think it's just a requirement. I, yeah. you know, I think that uh, there are those of us who are more comfortable with it, who are less put off by some of the trolling and, and the negative sides of it. But the, the upside is you do get to uh, relate to people. And it's, you know, Al will tell you that we have to deal with agents and editors and publicists and booksellers and all these people just so we can get close to readers and talk about our stories and listen to them talk about our stories. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing this. We're doing this for them. So social media gives you a 24 seven pipeline to the heart of a reader and them the same pipeline to your mind. Uh, I like that. And what is your website so people can get a hold of you? It's www.ronfrancel.com. Um, last name spelled F R A N S C E L L. Now, of course, we'll have that on the website so people can find it um, with one click. So, with um, one click. One click. How was how was writing this over the COVID stretch for you? Actually, I didn't. I wrote it before COVID, but then it enters the uh, publishing pipeline, which was affected by COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and so th- this is this one took a little longer to come out than it should have um, because of that. And that things were messed up there. What I did do during COVID, because I couldn't go to these places, uh, I couldn't talk to the people, I couldn't travel significantly, the motels were closed, uh, archives, libraries, courthouses, all closed, couldn't go. So I stayed home and I put all my forensic knowledge of, you know, all these 17 books uh, together and wrote a mystery, <laughs> so a fiction. Oh. So uh, now that COVID is appears to be subsiding, maybe I'll um, get back out on the road and find another great story to tell. Wow, fantastic. Well, everyone, now the book we're talking about is called Shadow Man. It's an elusive psycho killer and the birth of FBI profiling. And you need to buy this book. Um, you can't miss it. Yeah, and I should say for the listeners, there's a lot more to this story, and we didn't want to, you know, spill all the beans here today on the show. So get the book and find out because there's a lot more going on here. There we have it. So thank you guys <laughs> again. Our guest Ron Francel, thank you for taking the time to talk to us about your new book. Hey, thank you for making time for me. It's a great story to talk about. Get the latest news and opinions from Eric Shapiro from the House of Mystery website in the Shapiro Report. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.